Hello and thanks for tuning into my video. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the 6502 assembly language instruction set. I'm um, just kind of going through uh, most of the most of the instructions. Um, I'll spend most I'll spend more time on the ones that are used the most, and then there's some others that I won't uh, spend much time on. But um, as background for this, I've done a couple of other videos. Uh, one was on the hardware of the 6502, and one was on doing binary math and hexadecimal. So if you're not familiar with those things, you'll probably want to check those out because I'm going to be taking those for granted in this video. Um, so this one will be the third in the set on uh, 6502 assembly programming. Um, on the right here, I have the list of instructions kind of divided up into, th into groups. Um, different types or ones that are used for different things and then on the left I have my uh, Commodore 128 emulator I'm going to be using the the monitor and the 128 as uh, to, to do the demonstration here um, rather than a full assembler uh, because with an assembler I'd have to write write little programs assemble them load them into a disk all that business um, this will be faster to use the monitor um, I'll go ahead and show off the monitor here a little bit. Um, I talked in the other video about the hardware and the monitor. You, one, one reason to use the monitor is you can always view the um, registers. So you hit R and it shows you your current, the current uh, program counter location, the status register, the accumulator, the X register, the R register, and then the stack pointer. And so you can you can view those at any time. Um, you can disassemble memory, and so I have uh, I've already entered a few um, a few instructions here at uh, location B B zero zero. So you can disassemble a chunk of of memory. Um, you can also view memory just as a as a data chunk. So it looks like that. Um, which is more generally more useful if you've got memory that you're like storing text in or something like that. It's easier to look at it with the, the M command. You can fill a chunk of memory. Like if I want to fill that area from B00 to BFF with zeros, and then it's all zeros. Um, there's, there's a few different other, other things you can use this for. You can let it convert values for you like if you if I say okay what is FF in hexadecimal then it gives it to me in in decimal which is 255 octal which is 377 and then binary which is all ones and you can go the other way if you want to know okay what is 1010110 in binary well that's AA in hexadecimal and so on um, so you can use that for a conversion if you if you're if you're stuck on converting anything. Um, okay, the instructions in sixty five hundred two are all three letter instructions, um, and most of them are kind of mnemonics as far as what they 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 kind of sound like what they stand for. There are a couple of there that are odd, but um, most of them are fairly straightforward as far as their uh, their acronyms or, or something close to that. Now each instruction takes an, may take an argument. Some of them don't, but a lot of them take an argument, which is usually either a value that you're loading or saving or something like that, or it's an address, a, a location in memory. Um, and so for instance, I will start on the first ones here, load A, load X, and load Y. Those are used to load values into a register, either a value directly or a value from a, from a memory location. So if I start assembling, and that's, that's what A is for, if I want to start assembling at B100, um, which is not really 100, but I call it that anyway, um, you can load A, let's say, with the value 5. That's just going to load, it, load A directly into or it's going to load 5, the value 5, directly into the accumulator. And you'll see as you enter these things into the monitor, it shows the actual codes that the computer will read. And so load A, when it's loading a direct value, is A9, and then the 5 follows it. 
now if I were to load A from memory location 5, which I can do by not putting a hash sign in front of it, a pound sign, that's then different. Load A from a, from a zero page memory location is A5, not A9. And if I load A from a, from a larger memory location that's not in the first page of memory, then that's AD. So you can see how the, the monitor automatically, and, and an assembler would do the same thing, the monitor automatically figures out, okay, depending on what exactly you're doing with your load A, <clears throat> it translates that into the exact opcode um, that's needed. But you don't have to actually, as the programmer, you don't have to care about that. <clears throat> you just have to know what you're actually doing with the with the command. Um, so if we go to um, if we go back to BO2 here, we can also load X then with the value six, and we can load Y with the value seven. Okay. Now the break command, I'll. I, this one's lower down on the page, but I'll go ahead and mention it now because you can see them there. The break command just breaks out of the program. So anytime the computer is going along through a program executing instructions, it hits a break, it breaks out of the program. And in the monitor, what happens then is it, it just breaks out to the monitor. So you can see now my, I've got three instructions, load A with 5, load X with 6, load Y with 7, and then break. So if I jump to B100, then it executes those instructions starting at B100. It loads A with 5, loads A, and then it breaks and shows me the registers. So you can see here, then, that A now is 5, AC is the accumulator, XR is the X register, so X is 6, and YR is 7. Y, the Y register is 7. So it's loaded those three values into those three registers. Now, if I wanted to load from some other location in memory, instead of instead of just loading values, um, let's look and see what's at location like. Well, let's just look at location zero. Um, these might change because these zero page locations are used by the operating system and the monitor and other things, so they could change. But let's change it so that we're loading a from Zero, 0, not the value zero, 0, but the memory location zero, 0. And then let's load X from zero, 1 and load Y from zero, 02. Now if those if those locations don't change, we're going to get 2F, 7, 3 and 3F, but we might not. We'll, we'll see what we get. Okay, we got 2F and 7, 3, but we didn't get the zero, 0, so this the location 2 probably changes once in a while. If we check it again now, yeah, it's and plus some of these, some of the, yeah, some of these locations will change like as the monitor is running, as the program is running and things. So, anyway, the point is you can load from a memory location, you don't have to just be loading in a raw value. And the difference is, um, when you put a pound sign in front of it that makes it a raw value and not a memory location. So now with raw values I can jump and you can see that now the now the registers are loaded with five, six, and seven. Okay. So those are the load load A, load X, and load Y. And then you also have store A, store X, and store Y. And so you can store values from the registers out into memory locations. Um, now I'm going to use, I'm going to store into memory locations starting with C100 because I know that happens to be available. Um, so if we store A there, store X into C01 and store Y into C02. Okay. Now let's look at what is at C100 first of all. I've already put stuff there, so let's fill C100 with zeros. Okay, now let's look at our code. Alright, so we're loading A, X, and Y with 5, 6, and 7, and then we're going to store those three values into C100. So if we run this, it breaks out. We can see that our registers still have those values. And now those values are stored out at C100. Okay. 
And so the store the store a commands and and the load the the load commands and the store commands one thing to know is they they don't destroy what they're loading or storing from they're just copying those values so when you store it out of a register it state it's it's still in the register it's just being copied out to the memory location same way when you load a value from a memory location it's still there you're copying it in okay um now something else you can do let's look at our program here with any of these and with with a lot of with a lot of the commands that take an address you can also put comma x or comma y after them and what that does is adds the value of that register to the address here so if I make this c100 comma x and let's make this one c hundred c o one comma y. Oh, I can't. It won't do. That. It won't let me do that. Never mind. Um, okay. Let's see what a program looks like. Or let's let's fill c hundred again, so it's empty. Um, now let's see what the program looks like. Okay. So now instead of storing a at c hundred, it's going to store it at c hundred plus x. Well, x is 6, and so it should store a at the location c06. Let's run it and see what happens. And then let's look at um, c100. Okay, so you can see that the 5 that was in the accumulator got stored over here at c06 instead of c100. That's called indexing. Um, you can use either the x or the y register as an index when you're storing or loading or doing various other things with the A register. So that's a way you can use them in combination. Um, there are a few different addressing, well I guess there's about a dozen different addressing types. I'm not going to get into some of the more complicated ones this time because that's this is going to be long enough as it is. I'll probably do a separate video on those. But the main ones are what's called um, immediate addressing which is where you're loading in a raw value like load A5, load X6. There's absolute addressing, which is the like these stores when you're just storing in an absolute location, and then there's indexed ab indexed absolute where you're doing an ab absolute address indexed by one of the registers. All right, now let's tr let's um do let's just add keep adding on to the end of this here we have the transfer commands you can transfer um, from one register to another from from a to the other registers and back so you can transfer a to X and back and you can transfer a to Y and back you can't transfer between X and Y um, so if we transfer a to X and transfer a to Y when a is 5 let's see what happens Okay, now we can see that now they're all five because we we had five in the in the accumulator in A, and then we transferred A to X and transferred A to Y. So again, that's a copy. It doesn't you know it doesn't move it out of where it was. It just transfers it, um, copies it. I guess you'd say that one's pretty straightforward. It doesn't do anything fancy. It doesn't take an address because it doesn't need one. It just um, it just copies between registers. Now, now we come to math. Um, add. You can you can add in the accumulator. That's the only register you can add in. And you're going to add either a raw value. It, it's a lot like the load commands. You're going to add either a raw value or a value that's stored at some memory location. So we have five in the accumulator. Let's add the raw value seven. To that now one thing about adding I'll, I'll jump ahead a line here um, the reason it's ADC is it's add with add with carry now in one of the other videos I talked about the carry bit or the carry uh, status flag which is set whenever an add um, whenever an add operation Carry, carries over whenever it overflows out of the eight bits. There's some other things that set the carry flag, but basically, there's a carry flag that's always got either a zero or a one. 
and when you do an add with carry the carry flag gets added in there along with the other two things that you're adding um, there's good reason for that um, which I'll probably get into a little later um, but anyway the point is anytime you're going to add you need to clear the carry first unless you actually want that in there so I'm going to clear the carry and then I'm going to add with carry the raw value 7 alright so a, was, a is going to be 5, and then we're going to add with carry a 7 to that. So now we see that A is C, which is the hexadecimal for 12. So 5 plus 7 is 12. Um, now, if it had overflowed, the carry bit would be set. Now, I guess I need to talk a little bit about the status register here. Um, the status register I talked about in my, other, my first video... Um, has several different flags the only two we probably care about for this video are the carry the carry bit and the zero the carry flag and the zero flag um, the carry flag is the is the rightmost one um, the zero bit and so it would be a one here if it was set and the zero flag is the next one the bit one and so it would be a two here if it was set and if they're both set, it would be a three. Um, we probably won't be setting any other flags. Um, and so this is always either going to be zero, one, two, or three, depending on what we're doing. Right now, it's cleared because we just cleared it. And the, and the add didn't overflow it. Now, if we change this to where we added something that would overflow it, like let's, let's just add FF. Okay. okay, now it over it rolled over. And so 5 plus FF, which is 255, rolled over to 260. And so it set the carry flag here. And it left 4, which is all it could show in the accumulator. Um, if you think about what those are in binary, you're adding 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, along with, um, uh, along with 4 or no, 5, we're adding 5 to that, which is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1 is 5. And so you add those two, and you just don't have space for that in 8 bits, and so it overflows into the carry flag. So anytime you do an add, if, if you're adding numbers, you need to check the carry flag afterwards if there's a chance that it could, that it could overflow past 255. And you can also, let's see, look at our program so far. You can also add from a memory location, just like you can load from a memory location. So you could change this and say, let's let's add whatever is in location 2000. Okay, to location 2000 must have been zero. Yeah, okay, well, so location 2000 was zero, so it added zero to the five that was already in the accumulator and it still equals five. Um, oh, I should mention when you when you do an add, and it's going to be the same way with a subtraction. The the result is left in the accumulator, so whatever is in the accumulator gets wiped out by the answer. So you're you're adding what's in the accumulator with something else, and the answer is left in the accumulator. Um, subtract works the same way, um, except that when you subtract, you should always set the carry bit because that way it's available if it needs to borrow it. Um, so let's let's change this instead of adding. Let's subtract. Subtract with carry. Um, well, let's set the carry first. SEC sets the carry bit. CLC clears the carry bit. So we, we cleared it, but now we're going to set it. And then we're going to subtract with carry. Um, let's, let's, let's do 3 first. Okay, so the accumulator is 5. And then we're going to subtract 3 from it. Okay, and we can see that the accumulator now is 2. And the carry bit that we set is still set because it wasn't needed to borrow. 5 minus 3, you know doesn't need to borrow right now what if we subtract something larger than five like if we subtract seven ok 
Okay, now we 5 minus 7 rolls over and we end up with a large number, 254, but our carry bit is cleared and that alerts us that that we subtracted something larger than what we were, you know, we've got a negative number basically, that's what this represents is a negative 2, um, but the carry bit being cleared tells us that it had to borrow and so we have a negative number, it tells us, you know, we, we, we said 5 minus 7. And so this really represents negative 2, and the carry bit being cleared alerts us to that. Um, and again, you can, you can add and subtract from memory locations um, using these, you know, and you can also do index with all that. You can do all that stuff. Okay, that brings us to the bitwise operations. Um, these are probably some of the more difficult things to understand if you haven't done any bitwise type of stuff before. Um, I'm going to change their order here a little bit real quickly. Okay. The, the These work on the either the accumulator or on a memory location. They don't work on the X or Y registers. Um, but what they do is they shift the bits in the accumulator. The first four here in, in my list. They shift the bits in the accumulator or in the memory location, whichever you're working on. Um, either left or right, one one location. So, let's go back up here. And starting at B12. Okay, so our accumulator holds 5. So let's do an ASL. Okay, if you take a 5, which is, you know, in binary, 101, and you shift its bits left, that's what ASL does, is it shifts the bits left, you're multiplying it by 2. That's what it boils down to. Um, just as in a normal, you know, what we're used to, a base 10 number, if you take all the digits and shift them up to the left and, and add a 0, you've multiplied the whole number by 10, right? Well, in binary, since it's a base 2 system, if you shift all the bits left, you multiply it by 2. Now, the way this works, I'm going to show a couple of pages from one of my books here. Um, ASL is arithmetic shift left, and you can see here, um, when it shifts it left, it pulls in a 0 to take the, the space that got, up, that got left empty, and the, the high bit gets rolled off into the carry flag. So if your high bit was a zero, or whichever your high bit was, whether it was a zero or one, gets rolled into the carry flag. And so that alerts you whether you've run out of, you know, whether your number got too big and ran out of space. Um, and a zero comes in at the right end. And so your number just gets multiplied. Now back to here. And so our five shifted left became 10, which in hexadecimal is A. You can see that if you put in A, you can see, see there it's 10. Because if you look at the binary here, 101 became 1010. The zero came in from the, from the right end when it was shifted left. Now, if, let's see, let's say our number, <clears throat> Let's say A was loaded with something large, like FF, something that filled it up, and then we shifted it left. Okay, now the high bit rolled off into the carry flag, so the carry flag is set, and the accumulator is left with FE, which if you, if you look at the binary representation of FE, See, all the 1s from FF were shifted left, and a 0 was brought in on the right end, because that's that's how ASL works. And then the high 1, the high bit 1, rolled off into the carry flag. Okay. Now, LSR works the same way. If you just change this to LSR, from ASL to LSR, which stands for Logical Shift Right, I'm not sure why it's arithmetic shift left and logical shift right. That seems odd, but anyway. In that case, 
see it's taking it's shifting it to the right if we look at the book again it bring when it shifts right it brings in a zero for the high bit so the high bit automatically becomes zero and then the low bit the zero bit the zeroth bit um, goes into the carry so when we shifted it when we shifted ff right since ff is all ones when you shift that right it becomes 7f because 7f is well the binary doesn't show the zero but it's zero one 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 it's ff with the high bit um, cleared and again the carry flag gets the one that rolled off the right end if we had the accumulator set to 10 let's say and shifted it right then the accumulator becomes 5 because shifting right divides by 2 shifting left multiplies by 2 shifting right divides by 2 and so 10 becomes 5 and the carry bit is cleared because 10 which is a in hexadecimal has a 0 as its rightmost bit and so when you do if you use a uh, shift right if you use LSR to divide by 2 then the carry bit tells you whether you divided an odd number if it was an odd number the carry flag is going to be set. If it was an even number, it won't be. And so it's, it's basically your remainder from dividing by 2. Now there are two other shifting commands, rotate left and rotate Y. And they work exactly like ASL and LSR, except that instead of pulling in a 0 on the, on the end that needs another bit, they pull in the carry flag. And so that's why it's called rotate. Um, if I go to the book again here, see the rotate, when you rotate left, the high bit rolls into the carry flag, and what was in the carry flag rolls into the low bit. So that's why it's called rotate. It's rot it rotates around in a circle, basically. You, instead, of, really, you have nine bits that are all rotating. Um, and rotate right is the exact same thing just to the right and so in this case you're not pulling in a zero at one end you're pulling in the carry flag whatever happens to be in the carry flag so back to the monitor here we load a with 10 if we rotate that right it looks the same because 10 again is just going to roll, roll a zero off there but let's see let's uh let's look at our inspect our program again if we set the carry before the rotate now the accumulator becomes 85 because the carry bit it rotated right so 10 became 5 but it pulled the carry bit in on the high end, which is which is the eight. Okay. Um, now, if we make it a rotate left, we'll see the same sort of thing. We had ten. Okay, we rotated it left, and. You now this would be easier to see if I if you're not used to hexadecimal that's going to be hard to understand let's make this just five rotate it left okay when you rotate it left that doubles it so five doubled becomes ten which is a in hexadecimal but we're also rotating in the carry flag into the lowest bit and so since the carry flag was set that comes in 2 and it becomes 11. So, you know, five, 5 doubled plus the carry is 11, not just 10. Now, why would you use one or the other? Um, most of the time, I think you would use rotate left and rotate right because a lot of times you're using this for, um, like if, you, like if you want to double a number, but your number takes up more than one byte, you need to be able to carry 
that flag over from you carry that high bit over from one byte to the next um, so you would definitely use the rotate um, there but a lot of times if you if you're just starting out by doubling a number you might start with ASL because you know that's going to pull in a zero you don't have to care what the carry flag is if you clear the carry flag before doing a rotate it's it's doing the same thing as a shift um, but anyway you just have to remember that a shift just shifts and pulls in a zero on whichever end it needs a bit for and the rotates actually do a full rotate around through the carry flag but in both cases they're 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 just shift they're moving the bits one in that direction they're moving the bits one space in that direction okay and those can work on memory locations too so let's say um, you know we stored X into CO1 um, we can rotate left that location and now when we when we look at CO1 yeah we look at C100 say to look at that section we stored six into that memory into that location CO1 right here but then we rotated it left and six doubled is 12 you know from being rotated left and it pulled in the carry also which is 13 well that's D in hexadecimal let's use something smaller to make it easier to see what's going on um, let's, let's just or well let's see I gotta change it up here don't I let's let's load 2 into X um, need to make it a little bigger than that let's load 3 into X and then let's not set this carry okay alright so we loaded 3 into X stored X in this space CO1 which is right here and then we rotated it left which doubled it and so now, now we have six so three got doubled and six so you can use these the shift and rotate commands on memory locations as well as the accumulator just can't use them on X or Y all right that brings us to the bitwise operators um, you can and and or and exclusive or now check my other video if you don't know what those mean um, but basically they're they're boolean comparisons um, like add and subtract they leave the answer in the accumulator so let's go right here we have the accumulator filled with five if we and that well, let's see how do we want to do this um, Let's and that with, well, let's just do FF. Okay, yeah, that's not very interesting. Let's and it with um, six. Okay. Okay. With the best way to do, best way to explain this is but like I said check my other video on the actual bitwise arithmetic stuff but when you and something um, it's not adding it's it's doing an actual boolean and so five and six is actually four and the reason for that is five binary representation is 101 six is binary representation is 110 and so when you and them together the only bit that remains a one is the bit that was one in both of them and so what you get what you end up with is one zero zero so 101 and 110 the only one of the, the only bit that's set in both of those is the third bit right here the one well it the bit on the left I, I think of it as the third bit it's bit two but um, the leftmost bit is one in both of those but the other bits get cleared because they have a zero on one or the other and so you're left with one zero zero which is four um, the main use for this 
Um, well, there's a few different uses. One use is just to check whether a flag, check whether a value has a particular bit set. Um, because let's say, um, yeah, if you load, let's see. Well, yeah, you can, yeah, you can load from a memory location. Well, let's say you want to know whether the last bit is set in a particular memory location. What you can do is you can say, okay, load A with 0, 1, which is just the last bit is set, and then AND that with some memory location, like 2000. The result then is left in the accumulator. Now, if the last bit at 2000 was set, the accum then 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 that bit would remain set because it would be set in both of them, in the accumulator and in that memory location. And so the accumulator would still have a 1. Since it's got a 0, I know that that bit was clear at location 2000. Um, and also you can see this 2 right here in the status register means the 0 flag is set, which just the 0 flag is always set whenever the last operation resulted in a 0, which it did in this case. Um, let me check some memory location. Let's find a memory location that's got stuff in it. No. Okay, anyway, well, let's just use the first one. Um, let's and it with just zero, zero. Okay, and at that time, because the thing at 0, 0 is 2f, and so the last bit is set in it, and so when I end it with this value that has the last bit set, they both have the last bit set, and so the accumulator then is left with the last bit set. So um, 2f and 1 becomes 1, and so I know that that last bit was set at that memory location. Um, and the zero flag in the status register is not said because the, the result wasn't zero. Um, so that's and. Or works the same way. You can or values with the accumulator or you can or memory locations with the accumulator. It looks the same. Um, except that or sets all the bits which are set in at least one of the two locations instead of only instead of only the bits that are set in both locations like and or sets all the bits that are set in at least one of the locations um, and so 2f or 1 becomes 2f um, now and so or is usually used to check whether a bit is clear that's one possibility like if you wanted to check whether just the lowest bit was clear, you could OR with FE. And, uh, or no, that's not how you would do it. Um, OR, or is used most often really to set bits. Um, if you want to, if you want to set the bit at a location, you can use OR for that. Um, but yeah, it can, it can be used to check. Now let me think here. Yeah, it can be used to check if bits are, are clear, too. Um, but yeah, a lot, a lot of times it's just used to set a bit, because if you want to make sure the fourth bit in a value is set and you don't care about the other bits, you just OR it with that particular bit set, everything else zeros, and all the others will be left alone. Um, and then there, there's... Ex so let's see. Let's, uh, let's OR one with two. Or no, that wouldn't be interesting. Let's load A with 4 and OR it with 2. And you think, okay, what's that going to result in? Well, it's going to result in 6, which is not interesting either. Let's, um, <laughs> let's OR 4 and 6. 4 and 6 is 6. And the reason for that is 4 in binary is 1, 0, 0. 6 in binary is 1, 1, 0. So when you OR them, you end up with the bits set, which are set in both of those, which is just 110, which is 6. 
Okay. So th this is why I said before, you do have to understand the bitwise stuff because there are quite a few instructions that use it and it's useful for a lot of things in assembly language. And that brings us to exclusive OR. Um, an exclusive OR sets the bits which are set in one or the other, but not in both. And so if you change this to an exclusive OR, for exclusive OR 6 is 2. And if we look at the if we look at the binary representation of them again, we can see why. The first bit here is 1 in both, and so that ends up actually being cleared. And the 0, the bit that's 0 in both, stays clear. The only bit that gets set is the one which is 1 in one of them and 0 in the other one. And so we end up with 0, 1, 0, which is 2. So again, you can exclusive OR with a value or with a memory location, and, and the result is left in the accumulator. And that brings us to bit, which is one of the more complicated instructions. Um, bit does an AND with the accumulator. You can only use bit on a memory location, and you can't do any of the indexing stuff with it. Um, so it's a little bit limited, but it is kind of handy for certain things. Um, bit does, like I said, it does an AND on a memory location. So right there I'm going to AND the 4 that's in the accumulator with this memory location. But unlike the AND instruction, it doesn't leave the it doesn't change either one of those. It just does it, but it doesn't change the memory location or the value in the accumulator. It leaves them alone. But it sets the flags in the status register based on what happened. So when we break out here, we've we've anded the, the 4 with the value at the memory location, which I think was 2F, yeah. And so the, the result is 4. And so the, in the status register, the 0 flag is not set because the, the answer wasn't 0. And there's a couple other flags over here along with the 3. Um, which I guess we will I will talk about. There's a, there's a negative flag and an overflow flag. Basically, the seven bit and the six bit, the first two bits on the left in the status register, get copied from the memory location that you did the bit with. So in this case, the high two bits of this two F got copied into the status register. Now they're both zero because and so you don't see them showing up. So let's do the bit with location 1, which is 7, 3 there. Now the status register got some other stuff in it because two things happened differently this time. 7, 3 and 4 is 0. So our 0 flag got set because, there, because there's no bits left in that AND operation. Now the accumulator didn't get changed it's still 4 because this doesn't change the accumulator. It just sets flags. So it set the 0 flag and it also set the the 6th bit here because the 6th bit at the memory location was set. It left the, the 7 bit clear because the 7 bit at the memory location was clear. Um, like I say, it's, it's sort of an unusual command. It's a little more complicated than most of them, but it's really handy if you just want to check the sixth or seventh bit at a location, um, which I know one sometimes that's useful for when you're talking to other hardware, like if you're talking to a disk drive, um, or I know when you're talking to the 80 column chip, um, that tells you when it's ready by setting up setting, I think it's bit six at a certain location, it might be seven, but it's one of those two. It sets a bit at a certain location to say, I'm ready for another byte, and so you, you keep checking that bit until. It gets set, and then you send another byte along, and that's the way you time talking to certain hardware like that. So it's handy for some things like that because you could do the same thing by ending with a particular val with a particular value, but it would take more clock cycles, and you'd have to think about it more. Where with bit, you can just say, "Hey, I just want to see if the that bit that one particular bit is set. 
and you don't even have to care what you're anding it with. All right. Um, next here, I'm going to. I think I'm going to. Let me rearrange a couple things here. I'm going to talk about the looping or counting instructions. We have um, increment, decrement, or yeah, increment and decrement instructions. Let's see, 45 minutes. I might stop after an hour, but we'll see how this goes. Um, you can increment and decrement the X or Y registers, and you can also increment or decrement a value, a, a location in memory. You can't increment or decrement the accumulator, which is sort of surprising. You can add one to it with add, add with carry. Um, but the reason you can increment and decrement with these is that allows you to use them for counting and, and going through loops um, very handy, which we'll do some demonstration with in a second here. Um, so let's increment X, increment Y, and see what they are. Because that X was 3. If we look up here earlier in the program, we set X to 3 and we set Y to 7. Now if we increment them, see X becomes, why did X become 6? What do we do with X that made it? Oh, that's right. I transferred, and I need to take those out. I transferred A to X and A to Y earlier. Let me change those to no op. NOP is no op for no operation, which is just handy for sticking in programs when you just want to remove something. Um, okay. So, we had X was 3. Now we incremented it, so you can see down here in the status in the registers, x is now four, y was seven. We incremented it, and so y is now eight. Um, dex and dey are decrement; they subtract one. Same deal. Um, not much to it other than that. Um, the only thing I would add is that um, if if you have a if one of the registers has a value that rolls around so like let's say y is ff and then you do this you do this increment it rolls around to zero and it will also set the zero flag when it becomes zero and then so you can so that's set over here um, by this two um, so we took ff when you add one to ff the that register is full and so it has to roll over to zero and set the zero flag um, it also probably set the overflow flag, but that's not very important. And you can increment and decrement a, a memory location. So, you know, we, we stored X into CO1 before. We can increment, or let's, let's decrement, since we've incremented, let's decrement X, or not, not decrement X, let's decrement that memory location, CO1. Okay, so when we stored X into the memory location CO1, it was 3, but then we decremented that location, and so it became 2. So you can do the same thing to the X register, the Y register, or just some memory location, because sometimes you need to do a lot of looping, and just two registers aren't enough counters. All right. Um, the jumping, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be coming back to doing loops and things in a little bit, but I've got to cover a couple other things first. The jumping commands are very simple. Um, jump just jumps to another location. Basically, it just pushes that value onto the program counter, and so the next instruction gets taken from there. Um, let's... Uh, Yeah, let's just put in a jump right here. Jump, JMP for jump. Let's jump to B30. That's going to be down beyond where I've done any programming yet. It's just going to be a break command. Okay, so then if we go to the jump to the beginning of our program, 
it breaks, but you can see here in the program counter it broke out at B32. The it always shows you to pass the location where it actually broke at. Uh, that has something to do with if you want to resume, generally you want to resume with the next instruction, which is usually to pass where you are. So that's just sort of a way for it to be prepared for the next thing. But the point is, it didn't break right here at B1C because it jumped ahead to B30 and then it hit a break instruction there and broke out there. So a jump just jumps to a new location. Now, JSR is different. JSR jumps to a subroutine at a location. And what that means is, so we'll jump to B30, JSR to B30. What that means is it goes to that location and then runs there until it hits an RTS. RTS means return from subroutine. And so if we put a little bit of code at B30, like let's say we just put a, I don't know, well, we'll just put a, well, let's put a um, store A into 500, that's a, or 600, that's actually a screen location, and then return, okay. Oops, okay. All right, so our program is going to get here. And it's going to do a jump to subroutine at B30. If we look at B30, so it's going to jump down here to B30. And it's going to do this store. And then it's going to return, which means it's going to come back to where it was. And hit this break right here at B1C, which means it's going to tell us two spaces after that, which is B1E. So let's, let's jump to our program. Boom. It broke out at B1E, which means it came back here from the subroutine, and you can see right here it printed a D on the screen, which is what we told it to do with our store. Okay, So you've got two jumping commands. They both take an address. They both jump to that address. It's just that JSR stores a return location on the stack so that when it hits an RTS instruction, it can come back from that. And basically, the, the main use of this is to break your program up into pieces so that it's not just one long mess of stuff. You can break your, you can break your program up into subroutines and say, here's a chunk of code that does this, here's a chunk of code that does this, and then you can jump to those subroutines when you need to do things. Like, if, if you've got a, like you write a piece of code that prints a, a, a sentence on the screen, you can jump to that every time you need to print a sentence. You don't need to rewrite that code every time. All right, that brings us to the branch on conditions instructions. Um, these are basically, these are really kind of the heart of programming in assembly because these are the instructions that can make decisions and do different things depending on something else and that's really what it's all about is you know so far everything I've written just is going to do the same thing every time no matter what it, no matter what's going on and so you have to have instructions which can decide to do something different depending on something else um, the first one here is compare you can compare the accumulator or X or Y um, so you have a you have a different command for each one. CMP for the accumulator, CPX for X, CPY for Y. Um, so let's put let's start here at B19, and let's compare. Let's see, A is the accumulator has four at this point, so let's compare it to five. Okay, so we've got A in the accumulator. We're going to compare the accumulator to 5, and then it'll just break. Okay, so what happened there, if you look at the status register, it set the, actually it set all the high bits of the status register. Um, it set the negative bit and the overflow bit. And what's what that's telling me is that the let's see it's telling me that the compare that the value I compared to was more than the accumulator basically compare does a subtract it subtracts that value from the accumulator but it doesn't change the accumulator it just sets flags um, 
it sets the zero flag if the answer is zero. In other words, if the two values are the same, it sets the zero flag. Um, and then it sets the carry flag depending, or, or maybe it's the negative flag. I'd have to check on that. I might be getting the two mixed up, but it sets a flag based on whether one was larger than the other one also. And so you have the three different ways it can go. Is it larger? Is it smaller? Is it Are they equal? Um, if we change this to compare to four, which would be equal, and then run it. So now the carry bit and the zero bit both got set. Okay, that's what the three here in the status register is telling us. The carry bit and the four, and the both four bit are both set. Um, let's see. I want to straighten out the status register here, so it's a little less confusing. Let's change this y back to seven. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, here's our whole program so far. Um, all right, so we loaded it. We originally loaded it with five, but then down here we loaded it with four, so that doesn't, what was up above doesn't matter. Um, decrement some stuff, blah, blah, blah. Then we compare it with 4. All right, so we're comparing 4 with 4 now. And so, like I said, the 0 flag gets set and the carry flag got set. If we compare it with 3, now we're comparing it to something smaller. And now the 0 flag isn't set anymore because they're not equal. But the carry flag is still set. So when you compare, the 0 flag gets set if they're equal and the carry flag also gets set if the accumulator is more than the thing you're comparing with or I should say the register because you can also do this with X and Y if the register is more than what you're comparing with then the carry flag gets set if it's less than then neither one of them gets set all right so those are your three possibilities and I would have to probably I would, I would probably have to always check a book if I needed to remember which one is which most of the time, you're only, you only care, for looping especially, you only really care whether they're equal. Um, because then your next, your next two commands here are branch if equal and branch if not equal. And what they do is they branch to another location, just like jumping to it before. But they branch to it if something, if one of the status flags, you know, one of the status register flags is either set or not set. So branch if equal, for instance, branches if the zero flag is set. In other words, if the last thing that happened was equal to zero. And branch if not equal branches if the zero flag is not set. They're, they're always going pairs. So let's, uh, let's fill some of this stuff because I'm, we're getting a little confused here. Um, Okay, so starting new stuff at BOF. All right, let's say we want to compare A, compare the accumulator with five. Okay, that should be equal to zero. Five, or that that sh that should be equal. In other words, the zero flag will be set because a compare does a subtraction and then sets flags. So five minus five is going to be zero, so it'll set the zero flag. Then we want to branch if equal, let's just branch ahead to B40. That's just gonna be a break at B40. Okay. All right, so you can see here that it branched, it branched ahead to B40, broke out at B42, and it did set the zero and the carry flag. And so the branch if equal succeeded. Now, if we change it so it's comparing A to 6, the branch did not succeed. So it, bro it broke out right here at B15. It didn't branch ahead to B40 because, it, because the zero flag was not set. It was not equal to zero. The, the comparison was not equal. The, the whole business with equal 
you know, we say branch if equal, in other words, branch if the two values were equal, and it shows that by setting the zero flag. So the zero flag kind of gets double duty sometimes. Um, it can show whether two values are equal, and it can also show, but it does, the reason it's saying the two are equal is it's saying when it did a subtraction, the, the answer was zero. All right, and then you also have a few others, which I'm not going to demonstrate them all, but you have branch if carry clear and branch if carry set, and they work the same way. They branch if the carry flag is either clear or set, depending on which it is. There's branch if minus and branch if plus. Those branch based on the high bit of the status register, bit 7. Um, and like I was talking before, when you talk to the 80-column chip, you can use that to... Um, you can use that to branch very quickly based on whether the high bit of that chip is set that it uses to tell you whether it's ready for more data. Um, so branch of minus and plus branch based on that high bit. Branch of overflow bit, that's the that's the six bit, bit six, the next to highest bit of the status register. So you have all these branching instructions which can branch based on just certain bits of the status register and those, those four sets. Um, for branching based on whether something is set or cleared. So let's write a little loop here. Let's write a little bit of actual code. All right, we have five in our in our accumulator in our um, A register. So let's load X with let's say eight. Or in fact, let's just let's start over. B hundred. Let's load A with. Um, 5, let's load x with 8, and let's load y with 3. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's say we want to store a in a screen location. So let's store it into screen location 600 comma x. Now that's going to store it into 608 right now because when you when you put on a comma x that means add x to that value and and that then is your address. So it's going to store it the first time through it's going to store it into location 608. Okay. Um or actually no, let me do this a little differently. I'm going to do it the hard way first and then I'll do it the easy way. All right. Let's load x with 0. All right, so we're going to start storing at 600 because it's going to go 600 plus x, which is 0, so it's going to store it at 600. Then let's increment x. That's going to just add 1 to x. Then we can compare x to 8. All right. Now we'll branch, if not equal, back up to b06 which is where we're doing the store into A instruction. All right. So what should happen here? Let's see what happens. OK, it printed eight E's on the screen. So why did it print eight E's? Well, let's look at this. We loaded X with 0. We don't have to care about the load Y right now. It's not involved. We loaded we loaded five into the accumulator, which five is the value for E. That's why they're E's. Then we stored A into location 600 comma X, which when X was zero, that just meant store into location 600. Well, that's right here on the screen. Then we increment X, so now X became one, and then we compared X with eight. Well, that's they're not equal, and so that cleared the zero flag because they're not because subtracting one minus eight doesn't equal zero so in our branch if not equal succeeded and it branched up here to b06 so then it does it again it stores a into 600 comma x except now x is one so now it stores it into location 601 which is the next location on the screen then it incremented x to become two compared it again but they're still not equal. X is still not equal to 8. So it branches again back up here. It goes through this 8 times. The 8th time it comes through, X gets turned into 8, incremented to become 8. 
then it compares it now it is equal to zero the result is zero and sets the zero flag so now the branch if not equal fails it falls through to the next break and so we break out so that's essentially how you do loops anytime you want to loop a certain number of times you 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 count with one of the index registers or possibly with a memory location but the index registers are faster if you have one to use and then you can also use those index registers as you're looping to do something like indexing across a screen or through memory locations or something like that um, a really quick and easy way to clear the screen is let's just show let's just do that real quick um, or to fill the screen with something let's say the screen runs from 400 to um, 7 something it's not exactly 7 ff cuz it doesn't it's only a thousand locations not 10 4 10 24 but if you just fill from 400 up to 7 ff <clears throat> filling this out now we'll increment X compare X to 0 um, actually we don't even need that we just I'll explain why in a second branch if not equal up to B06 okay let's look at our program now <clears throat> okay this time we're doing the same thing except we're storing a into four different locations at the same time each each time through the loop we're storing it at 400 comma x 500 comma x 600 comma x 700 comma x so we're going to store it in four different screen locations <clears throat> and then we're going to increment x and then we're going to branch if not equal now i didn't do a compare this time because the increment x command will set the zero flag when x becomes zero the first time through, x is going to become 1, and so it will not be 0, and it will branch back up here, and it will do the stores again with x equal to 1, then it will do them equal to 0, or, sorry, equal to 2, equal to 3, and so on, as it keeps incrementing x. Eventually, x will get up to ff, and then increment around 0, and at that point, the 0 flag will be set, and it will fall through this branch if not equal, because it will be equal that time. So, if we do that... Boom! It filled the whole it filled the whole screen with ease, and then when it broke out, it it uh, moved it up. But um, so that's a way you can fill the screen, or or fill you know that that filled a thousand screen locations, but you could be filling a thousand locations anywhere um, with that. All right, so that is the compare and branch instructions. Um, let's see, we're a little over an hour here, but there's not a lot left to do. So let me plug ahead. The stack. I haven't talked about the stack yet. Um, the stack is a section of memory from 100 to, it's not really 100, but from page, it's, it's page 1 in memory. It's this page of stuff right here. Um, and the stack fills in from the bottom up, from, from down here upward. Um, <clears throat> the stack is a place you can push values to save them and then pull them back um, I explained it in one of my other in my first video about the 6502 um, it's called a stack because it, it works like a stack like a stack of dishes um, except that it's upside down but when you put when you push something into it the next time you pull off of the stack you get that top value back you get back the last thing you went in it's called a, a lifo a lifo stack last in first out so if you push three things onto the stack and then you pull something back from the stack, you get the third one back, and then you get the second one back, and then you get the first one. So let's demonstrate that. Um, let's see. Let's fill our memory again. B06, BF0. All right. Let's start at B06. Let's push A onto the stack. 
Now you can only push the accumulator, you can't push X or Y. So if you want to push X onto the stack or Y onto the stack, you have to move them to the accumulator first. So let's transfer X to A, then push it to the stack, transfer Y to A, push it to the stack. All right, and then let's look at how that looks. Um, so our program here, we've loaded X or here, let's let's do this. Let's load A with five, X with seven, and and Y with nine, just to kind of have things in some sort of order to keep track of what's what. All right. So we load A with five, X with seven, Y with nine. Then we push A on the stack. Then we transfer X to A, push A on the stack again, transfer Y to A, and push that on the stack. So if we run that, okay, it breaks out. You can see that A ended up with the 9 from the Y. It was the last thing that was transferred to A. Now the stack pointer is pointing at 3, 9 right now. That means the stack pointer is saying the next value, the next available spot on the stack is 3, 9. So if we look at the stack... went too far. Let's look at it again. Just up to 140. Okay. 139 is right here. And so, or, no, sorry. 139 is right here, this B1. And so, it's saying that is the next available one. If you pushed another thing onto the stack, it would go right there, which means the, la the next three values are the ones I just pushed on it. So you can see there's the 5 that I pushed on first from A, then there's the 7 that I pushed on from X, and there's the 9 that I pushed on from Y. So if I pull something back off again, let's say right here after I've done all that, let's say I load A with 0, and then I pull A, PLA for pull A, which means pull the pull the top stack value onto the accumulator. Um, now the accumulator gets that nine back. And let's see, let's do it this way. Let's load A with the accumulator or load A with 0, let's load X with 0, and let's load Y with 0. Okay, so they're all zeroed out. Then let's pull A. That's going to get the top thing back out, which should be 9. Let's transfer that to X this time. Let's pull A again with the next thing, which should be the 7. Let's transfer that to Y, and then let's pull A. All right. Okay. So basically what we ended up doing was swapping the X and Y. X started out at 7, but when we pulled the values back off the stack, we, we pulled them back off and transferred them into X and Y in the opposite order. So we ended up swapping them. But the point is, we pushed things on the stack, we pushed on 5, then we pushed on 7, then we pushed on 9. So when we started pulling them off, we pulled off the 9, and then the 7, and then the 5. It's last in, first out. Um, like I said, this is handy for if you just need to store some values really quickly and then get them back. Um, the one thing you have to be careful with with the stack is that um, if you push some things on the stack, and then some other code pushes some other things on the stack, you can't get at what you had what you pushed on there in, in the first place until those other things get pulled off because you're always getting out whatever went in last um, to get at something else you'd have to start getting fancy with the stack pointer moving it around and stuff and then that gets that gets kind of hairy um, so usually you want to be careful that say you have a subroutine that does something like printing a printing a line on the screen and you want to store a couple values on the stack so that you can use the register to do this or something. Well, 
you need to make sure you put those values on the stack at the beginning of your routine and then you get them back at the end of your routine so you leave the stack as you found it um, that's basically the the kind of the, the rule to follow is anytime a root anytime a particular routine messes with the stack leave it as you found it so that you won't mess with what some other routine was putting on it because in assembly language program there is no such thing as you know local variables or anything like that you're you're in charge of you know you're in charge of making sure your code doesn't conflict with itself or you know that one routine doesn't hammer another routine that's all up to you um there's a couple other stack things which are not nearly as commonly used um there are commands you can also push the the status register onto the stack or pop it back out that's basically for if you just if you need to save your status flags while you go do something else you can do that you can push push the status register onto the stack go do your other work come back pull it back off and you still have those flags there um i can't say that's used very commonly but you know it, it may come in handy at some point there's a couple of debugging commands which i've mentioned already no op is no operation it's just a, a command you can use mostly when you're writing a program and you just need to take out a, a command you just put in a no op in its place because when you're writing especially in a monitor like this um, you know you, you can't it's it's not easy to move a chunk of code up to fill in space and so if I want to if I say well I don't want to do this transfer x to y x to a right here well I'll just I'll just put in a no, a no op um, and then it just doesn't do anything at that point. It's just like nothing happens at that point. And then break, we've been using all along because break just breaks out of a program and tells you what's going on with the registers. Um, other down here, these are ones you don't use much at all. Um, set and clear decimal mode. The, the 6502 has a decimal mode, which I would not recommend ever using really. Um, what it does is, and I'm not even going to bother to, to demonstrate these, but what it does is um, makes it so that all the math and storage and stuff that it does treats num treats the numbers sort of as if they're decimal instead of hexadecimal. And so it doesn't use the full bits of, uh, of a location. Um, it, it Basically, it only goes up to 9.9 instead of FF. I've seen. A, I remember seeing a couple games that use this, like to store scores and stuff like that. I suppose you have to do it. It saves you from doing a little, it, or it lets you do a little less conversion when you're displaying those values. But um, I don't know. To me, it's just weird. I, you know, computer. The computer is a base two system. Just use the base two system. Plus, it give it it. You can't store as large a numbers with it, and you're already kind of limited in a system like this anyway, so I don't like it. Um, set and clear interrupt mode. Um, interrupts in a computer are, you, you have hardware interrupts, and you, have, and you can also have software interrupts, but an interrupt is basically a way that one program can break in and take over running the computer and make other programs, in, in, in a case of a single... Um, you know uh what do you call it uh single tasking system like this the only program but anyway um one program can break in and make another program wait while it interrupts it and does some other work that's basically mand i mean this it's necessary because let's say you want to get you want to get um keyboard presses let's say well the keyboard has to be you know the computer has to stop and check the keyboard once in a while for that to be able to happen for your keyboard to function um, and so on like a Commodore 64 or 128 that happens every 60th of a second there's a there's a routine that interrupts whatever program is running does things like that pulls the keyboard uh, updates the video whatever needs to be done on a regular basis and then comes back to the program so if your program needs to do something, some, sometimes there's some stuff you need to do, like setting certain registers that you you can't you, you can't let whatever you're doing needs needs to take a little time, and it can't afford to be interrupted. 
um, say you need to set two registers and you need to make sure you set them as a pair, you can't afford to get interrupted in between setting those two. And so you can set the interrupt mode to say, don't interrupt me right now. And then you clear it when you're done with that. And that's what those are for. Um, like I said, don't, you don't use those very often, but you know, they are there because it, it is possible to need them. Um, and the interrupt bit is a flag in the status register, um, but it's not really a status flag. It's a, um, an, an interrupt flag. There's You can clear the overflow bit. You can't set it, which is interesting, but you can clear it. You can clear the overflow bit in the status register. Um, again, that it's not a bit you set, not a bit you use very often. Um, return from interrupt routine. You can re, you can write your own interrupt routines. Like if you want to write your own um, routine that, uh, oh gosh, I don't know. That let, let's say you want to write a routine that shows the the time on the screen, um, and you know up in the corner or something like that. And so it needs to break in every so often and. Um, and figure out the time and print it up there on the screen. Well, you know, and it needs to do that on a regular basis so that it keeps getting updated every second or whatever. Well, you'd write your interrupt routine and you'd hook that into the system's interrupt routine that it already has that's, like I said, checking the keyboard and stuff like that. And then when your routine finishes, it would return from interrupt. So it's just, um, it's, it's like the RTS command returning from subroutines but it returns from an interrupt routine which is a, a somewhat different thing because you need because basically you're alerting the, pr the processor that hey I'm done interrupting so you can move on and the last one here transfer between X and the stack pointer this is if you need to deal with the stack pointer which like I said that's that's getting into tricksy stuff which you normally don't want to do but if you do need to mess with the stack pointer you can copy from X to the stack to the stack pointer or vice versa you can pull them back and forth um, okay so that is all of the 6502 instructions I um, hope this has been useful um, soon I will start actually programming something I haven't decided what yet I don't know if I'm gonna do the tic-tac-toe thing I might be kinda of burned out on tic-tac-toe programming um, but it needs to be something fairly simple like that, something in that at that level, um, because I'm guessing that would take a you know several hours, um, if not more. And so I you know I'm not going to tackle some sort of complicated game that would take you know months. Um, I'm going to start with something a little simpler than that. But um, certainly open to suggestions and also questions. If anyone has questions about any of this, there should be. Uh, Places to comment underneath the, the videos wherever you found them. I'm trying to put them both, trying to put them on uh, BitChute and YouTube at this point because um, YouTube especially is getting is starting to shut people down for for stupid reasons lately. And uh, it's just best to diversify and not count on any one location to store your stuff. Um, and also make sure you always save your stuff on your own system too. But anyway. Um, Hope this was educational and or interesting, and uh, thanks for watching. I'll be back with another video soon.